In God we trust. So steht es auf jeder US-Dollar-Note. Religion, das ist zumindest in den USA ein wichtiger Bestandteil des öffentlichen Lebens. So füllt denn auch mein heutiger Gast riesige Hallen mit ihren Predigten. Die lutherische Pfarrerin Nadia Bolz-Weber ist in den USA längst ein Star, obwohl oder genau weil sie eine sexuelle Reformation der Kirche fordert. Guten Morgen, Frau Bolz-Weber. Herzlich willkommen. Good morning. Frau Bolz Weber, ich habe es gerade eben gesagt, Sie sind in den USA ein großer Star. <lacht> Superstar. That might be a little exaggerated. <lacht> Aber was macht Sie überhaupt so berühmt? Hier ist es nicht so bekannt, dass Pfarrerinnen so bekannt sind. Um, I think, I think maybe it's, I try to articulate things that are true, uh, that seem to go unspoken otherwise. And I, And I really try to be honest about myself. So I, if I'm going to explore something, I'm going to do it by looking inward and trying to figure out maybe a difficult truth about myself mm -hmm. and illustrating things that way rather than speaking down to people as an expert. Yeah. Teil ihrer Berühmtheit hat aber sicher auch mit ihrem Äußeren zu tun. Sie haben viele Tattoos. Ist das so etwas wie ein unique selling point für Sie? Um, maybe initially it gets people attention, but I've, I've written four books and three New York Times bestsellers and they're translated into eight languages yeah, and that, that doesn't happen just because you have tattoos. So I think that, uh, that it certainly gets people's attention to begin with, but I don't think it's ever enough to hold somebody's attention. Ich möchte gerne über zwei dieser Tattoos sprechen. Sie haben hier am Handgelenk eines, das heißt Sinner and Saints. Können Sie darüber erklären, was, was es zu bedeuten hat? Was von Ihnen ist Heilige? Was ist Sünderin? So, yeah, it says simul use to set peccator, so it's Latin. Yeah. Uh, and it was this idea of Martin Luther's that we're all simultaneously at the same time sinner and saint like 100% of both, mm -hmm. whereas some theologies would have people be these horrible, uh, deranged creatures, you know, who are just all bad. Yeah. Or there's some kind of philosophy and theology that says, oh no, human beings are, are godlike and all of the good was, is within us and we can be completely sanctified. And neither of those things feel like accurate descriptions of actual human beings. And so to me, I think, Uh, saying that we're always a combination of both all the time, it just feels more accurate and ultimately to me actually more hopeful as well mm -hmm. than one of the extremes being sold to us as the whole truth. Mm. Wo sehen Sie selber für sich das, dass Sie eine Sünderin und eine Heilige sind? Well, I, I guess I've seen like the way that it feels as if God has managed to get like beautiful redemptive things done through me mm -hmm. despite the fact that like I'm cynical and I can have horrible attitude and um, I'm very judgmental like mm -hmm. there are these things about I'm an alcoholic I'm a recovering alcoholic and so there are parts of me that will always have rough edges to them yeah. and yet I still get to participate in beautiful things in the world mm -hmm. so to me that's like one aspect that My failings or my mistakes are never the final word mm. to me. Sie haben auch noch Maria Magdalena tätowiert. Hat das auch damit etwas zu tun? Well, Mary Magdalene I got when I was in seminary as like a way of reminding myself that I was called to be a preacher despite, maybe not despite any of my failings, but maybe because of my failings. And... Um, Mary Magdalene was the first witness to the resurrection mm -hmm. and she was the first preacher. I mean, yeah. without her witness, there is no Christianity mm -hmm. and that she was chosen. And while um, history makes us believe that she was a prostitute, actually the text does not bear that out. Mm -hmm. That's not actually true. It's a conflation of different characters. Mm -hmm. But um, But she was, she did have demons cast out of her. So she did have things she struggled with that she ended up becoming healed from as a result of her encounter with Christ. And um, I related to that. So, 
yeah, she's an important figure to me. Mm -hmm. In Interviews verwenden Sie ja auch eine sehr direkte Sprache immer wieder. Ich habe sogar gelesen, dass Sie zu Gott beten, er möge Sie doch ein weniger großes Arschloch machen. Meinen Sie das ernst oder ist das Provokation? Wie muss man das verstehen? No, I mean that 100%. <lacht> That's my, that's my kind of faith. I, like, faith is really sort of sold to us as this way of purifying or sanctifying ourselves, as if like with enough prayer or even with mm -hmm. enough yoga, we can like smooth out all of our Machen rough Sie auch yoga. edges. Oh, I do a lot. Yeah, yeah. I practice it a lot. It hasn't totally worked on me. <laughs> Like my big dream is to not get angry in a yoga class. One day, maybe it hasn't <laughs> happened. But um, but it, so much spirituality is sold to us as a way of smoothing ourselves out, yeah. all the rough edges, making ourselves pure, as if with enough of those practices, you know, we can sanctify ourselves. But I I think that the rough edges, the jagged edges of our humanity, mm. are what create enough texture on us that we can connect to God and to one another. It's not through these pure things, through these smooth things about us. It's through the rough things. I never feel connected to somebody until they tell me horrible things about yeah. themselves. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Then da I können feel Sie like, Verbindungen schaffen. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I feel that way with God as well. That yeah. I don't have to sort of present the shiniest, most acceptable parts of me. Um, those things are just fine in a way without uh, spiritual help. But mm. I need help with the rough parts of me. So, and I believe in grace so much that I never am ashamed of admitting why I need it. Mm. Das, Sie sprechen hier etwas Wichtiges an, weil Sie haben ja auch ein sehr bewegtes Leben. Sie waren, Sie haben es schon gesagt, Alkoholikerin. Sie haben sogar abgetrieben. Das haben Sie noch nicht so lange öffentlich auch mitgeteilt. Sie sind aber eine weibliche Pfarrerin. Für viele Christen ist das ein Problem, diese Kombination. Welche Rolle spielen für Sie Kritiker? Um, my critics play almost no role at all for me. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that people who are drawn to the type of Christianity that really centers controlling people's bodies, controlling their sexuality, controlling their beliefs, putting people in this very stern sort of metal box, and that's what Christianity is, they have so many pastors for yeah. them. Yeah. There are so many books for them. There are so many speakers at conferences that are just for them. Mm. They don't need me. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not for them. Yeah. And so I, um, I'm called to the people for whom that kind of Christianity is not compelling at all. Yeah. Because a lot of people are drawn to the beautiful aspects of Christian thought and practice. They're drawn to the gift of it but they're really put off by the wrapping that it's in. And I think so much of Christianity has confused the wrapping and the gift. Aber wer sind denn insgesamt jetzt aus Erfahrung rausgesprochen Ihre Leser der, der Bücher, die Sie schreiben? Weil, soweit ich weiß, werden Sie in christlichen Buchläden nicht verkauft. No, no, Christian bookstores would never carry my books. <laughs> but, they, but you find them in Barnes and Noble, like regular bookstores, yeah. right? So um, from what I can tell, the people who are drawn to these books are people who are sort of unsatisfied by that type of shaming legalistic Christianity, but are still compelled by Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so people, I spend most of my life tra traveling around speaking at events, and people tell me their stories, and they tell me, hey, I was raised in a church, and now I'm not a part of it. Yeah. And usually it's because, you know, their mother divorced their abusive father and the church wouldn't let her take communion anymore mm. or they're gay and they were told you have to choose between your sexuality and your spirituality mm. or things like this nobody's ever said to me well i was raised christian but i left the church because i just feel like jesus didn't have much to offer mm -hmm. that's never the issue so i think there people are sometimes secretly really love jesus but can't stand 
churches that bear his name. And I think a lot of times that's who my audience is. Mm. Sie haben Anfang des Jahres oder vor einigen Monaten für vier Wir Wirbel gesorgt, weil sie Frauen aufforderten, ihre Purity Rings, also sowas wie Keuschheitsbezeugungen, yeah. einzusenden. Und sie wollten das zu, einer, yeah. äh, zu einem Kunstwerk machen. Was, <lacht> was haben Sie da genau gemacht yeah. und was geht das genau? So, Purity Rings was part of this, there was the Purity Movement in America yeah. that, that sort of, in my moments of deep compassion, which are very rare, <laughs> yes, yes. In, in my moments of compassion, I know that, that the reason this movement started is, was as a result of the AIDS crisis. Mm -hmm. And so I think Christian parents were like, sex is killing people. Yeah. How can we keep our kids safe? Mm -hmm. uh, but they overshot the target because mm -hmm. what they did was they said, um, look, God's will is that you completely disengage from your own sexual nature and desires uh, until you're married. And so especially girls were uh, given these purity rings as this pledge. And it was a little creepy because they would, their dad would come and bring them flowers mm -hmm. and they'd go to a dance like it was a date. And purity then, balls? Yes, something. a purity ball. And, uh, and then their dad would put this ring on their finger and the girl at 11 or 12 years old. Yeah, also die wissen noch gar nicht, worum es geht eigentlich before they even know what sex is or what they want or even who they are. Yeah. They're pledging to their God and their church and their dad yeah. that they won't have sex until a different man puts another ring on her finger yeah. when she gets married. Und dann löst quasi dieser Ehemann den Vater ab. That's right, that's right. So then, um, so you're, you're giving your sexuality to one man yeah. until you give it to another man and it never belongs to you. And I've met so many young women who, of course, went along with this, but then later in life, it was sort of crippling to them. They found themselves not being able to connect to what their own, their own desires were, mm. who they were as a sexual mm. being, mm. and like they're trying to connect frayed wires. Mm. And it was really damaging to a lot of women. And so I had this dream of, I wanted women to mail in their purity rings and I would melt them into a sculpture of a vagina. Mm. And uh, because there's this verse in the Bible that talks about beating our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. Yeah. So it's this biblical concept of saying, we're going to take something that harmed us and we're going to repurpose it into something that heals us. Mm -hmm. And so um, I did this, and it, uh, it was a piece that was designed by the woman who makes all of my jewelry. Her name's Nancy Anderson, mm -hmm. um, and she has a company called Sweet Bird Studio. She makes most of my jewelry. Mm -hmm. And she uh, had melted the, the purity rings down to a sculpture of a vagina, mm -hmm. and then I gave it on stage at a conference, the Makers Conference, yeah. which is a feminist uh, group. I gave it to Gloria Steinem as a gift. A yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Ich finde das sehr spannend. Es ist ja aber trotzdem eigentlich so, Sie, Sie beschreiben da, wie die, die, Sie, die Frauen auch gelitten haben unter diesen Ringen, aber trotzdem ist es doch so, dass mm. es ziemlich verbreitet ist. Wir haben auch im Internet diverse Bilder und Angebote gefunden von diesen Purity Rings. Yeah, it, it is. It's still going on. And my hope is that the girls who are being conned into this when they're so young will find their way to themselves and their own bodies and their own sexuality eventually, mm. despite the fact that the church has sought to shut all of that down. Mm. Wie waren denn insgesamt die Reaktionen auf diese Aktion? Well, um, the, women, uh, the women who mailed them in sent me incredible notes with the, with the rings. Things like, please melt this down, it only caused me misery. Mm. Um, there were all of these letters that told me about being sexually assaulted by men in their own churches. Yeah. And that they, they felt like they were these soiled, damaged people because mm -hmm. of something someone else did to them. I mean, it was, they were wrenching these mm. letters. Mm -hmm. And so, Uh, the, yes, there was a lot of critique. People lost their minds. The conservative Christians hated this. They thought it was idolatry. Um, but, but Wegen dem goldenen Kalb, das da quasi... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. right. So, um, but I'm unbothered because mm. my work is not for them. Yeah. It's for these women. Ich sehe das absolut und ich verstehe das Anliegen. Man könnte aber trotzdem sagen, 
Für diese Leute ist es sehr wichtig, man, man kann es respektieren und das, was sie machen, könnte man so verstehen, als würden sie sich darüber lustig machen. Um, perhaps, but I think uh, that's a risk I'm willing to take yeah. if it offers freedom mm. to, to people who feel like they're in bondage. Mm. If, the, if their captors feel mocked, I'm unbothered by mm. it. Mm. I'm more concerned with the freedom it offers. Mm. Man muss natürlich diese Bewegung eben auch auf dem Hintergrund der, der, der Landschaft, der religiösen Landschaft der USA sehen. Es gibt auch viele fundamentalistische ähm, christliche Gruppierungen. In Europa kennt man das insgesamt viel weniger. Einzelne kennt man eben auch äh, wahre Liebe wartet und so weiter. Aber es ist hier nicht so verbreitet. Ist das, stimmt das, dass es so stark in Europa, äh, dass Sie das beobachtet haben? Uh, it is really different uh, in my travels in Europe. There's not the same sort of extremes that there seem to be in America. Yeah. And America is also less secular mm -hmm. than Europe is. Mm -hmm. And also you have this history of, of state church, which to Americans it's is very sense. foreign. Yeah. I, I never feel more American than when I'm in yeah. a place that has a state church and I yeah. see how connected the two things are. Where, Weil you know, alles privat ist quasi und man muss mit, mit Spendengeldern die Kirchen finanzieren. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. And so it's, um, it's just, it, it's more personal, it's less civic. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I have found there are people uh, here in Europe who who do read my books and who seem compelled by the message as well. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, in a way, when I was in my parish, um, people said that they loved that I was, uh, that they had a preacher who's clearly preaching to herself and just letting them overhear it. Yeah. And so there's a way in which I write these things because they're, it's what I need to hear. It's the, it's a process I need to go through. Mm -hmm. And then if it's helpful for other people, I'm thrilled by that. Mm -hmm. And if other people react negatively to that, it has nothing to do with me. It has to do with them. So. Das heißt, Sie haben diese Gemeinde, Gemeinde die ja auch House of All Sinners and Saints heißt, äh, eher für sich als für die anderen gegründet. There's a way in which that's true. Um, I created it out of what I desired to exist in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, but to, in order to be the leader of that church, um, it, in that situation, it had to be for them. If it was truly only for me, mm -hmm. I would still be there. Mm -hmm. I, I left in July because yeah. I didn't want it to have founder syndrome. So I started planning my departure the first year of the yeah. church, 10 years ago. Da, darüber reden wir gerne danach noch weiter. Ja. Yes, yeah, good. Ähm, kommen wir vielleicht noch zu Ihrem Buch. Sie haben kürzlich dieses Shameless geschrieben und äh, da fordern Sie eben eine sexuelle Reformation. Sie schreiben, dass die Kirche die Sexualität kontrolliere und sie eine Konkurrenz eben zur, zur Religion darstelle. Da frage ich mich erst mal, von welcher Kirche reden Sie und inwiefern Konkurrenz? Well, that all came about because, um, like, I'm ordained in the Lutheran Church, yeah, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, which is, which in America is a fairly liberal denomination. Yeah. But I had to sign something when I was ordained that said I'd be faithful in marriage mm -hmm. or celibate in singleness, yeah. which I didn't think about much. I'm mm -hmm. ashamed to say because I was married and it yeah. didn't matter. Yeah. But then I was divorced mm -hmm. and um, I experienced a profound difference. I was married to a very good, good man. War auch uh, ein lutherischer Priest, äh, yes, Pfarrer. also yeah. a Lutheran pastor. Yeah. That's right. And um, but we never connected in the way that either of us needed to mm -hmm. so it was a very lonely marriage mm -hmm. and without any kind of intimacy and that was hard for me mm -hmm. um, and then when I got divorced and started dating my boyfriend and we did connect in all of the ways emotionally physically sexually um, spiritually it it was amazing for me like it was good for my mind and my body and my heart and my spirit and yet I was now disobeying a rule that the church had given me mm -hmm. but I was healthier mm -hmm. and so I just found it puzzling like why would the church why is it better for my congregation if I'm 
not having sex. That just mm -hmm. didn't even make sense because I felt like such a more open-hearted, softened person. Also das hängt irgendwie zusammen, sagen Sie. Also ein spirituelles Wesen kann auch ein sexuelles Wesen sein. Können Sie das genauer erklären, wo jetzt diese Konkurrenz liegt, die Sie ansprechen? Well, okay, so what happened was, this was all going on, and I was together with Eric for a couple of weeks, and then I had to go... Das ist Ihr Freund. My, my boyfriend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, then I had to support uh, the UK edition and the German edition of my last book. Mm -hmm. So I was on tour for three and a half weeks yeah. after us only being together a couple of weeks. And this was all swirling in my mind. And I, he's not Christian. Mm -hmm. And I, I Skyped with him, and I said... Why do you think the church has tried to control sex for so long? Mm -hmm. And without skipping a beat, he said, I always assumed that the church saw sex as its competition. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I'm writing a book. Like that, that was <laughs> the moment. Oh, yeah, I was supposed to be writing a different book. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm going to write. And it was me puzzling that out. Like yeah. I knew it was true, mm -hmm. but I had to discover in a year and a half, two, two years of writing, how it was true. Yeah. And so I interviewed my parishioners for almost two years and just said, what message did you receive from the church, whatever church you were raised in, about sex and the body and gender? Mm -hmm. And how did that message affect you? Mm -hmm. And how have you navigated your adult life? And so that, that book is the result of those conversations. Und war das kein Problem für, für, für die Gemeinde, dass sie sie so äh, intime Fragen, ähm, ja, dass sie ihnen so intime Fragen gestellt haben? Ja. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I was shocked how many people were immediately willing to have that conversation with me. Mm -hmm. Like, they were waiting to be asked, almost. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then um, I felt like they just poured out. They were able to make this connection between the message the church gave them mm -hmm and uh, a lot of harm they had experienced. And so the premise of the book is that if the teachings of the church are harming people, we should rethink the teachings. Mm -hmm. So um, we should never be more loyal to an idea or a doctrine or an interpretation of a Bible verse than we are to people. So that's the case I'm making in the book. Aber was ist denn so gefährlich an der Sexualität, dass sie von der Kirche als, äh, als so ja, quasi so nur mit Handschuhen äh, berührt wird. Well, I think um, a lot of it has to do with a fear of women, actually. I think misogyny mm -hmm. is the root of a lot of the sexual teachings in the church, that um, I think women have been perceived as a sort of threat to male power, and one of the ways that men can sort of Uh, maintain their dominance in society is by controlling the bodies and the sexuality of women. This is, the, this is just human history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not like opinion. I think we kind of see it in mm -hmm. human history. Um, but another reason is because uh, there is something transcendent uh, about human sexuality. There's mystery in it. Um, and so I think that it allows, both with sex and religion, I think we're seeking some kind of, um, some kind of uh, alleviation of our existential uh, aloneness. The fact that that angst that we experience as human beings that is rooted in the fact that on an existential level, we're alone. And so we seek union. In religion, we seek union with God, and in sex, we seek union with another person. Mm. And both of those things helps to alleviate that existential aloneness. So mm. I think that's one of the things that it has in common. Mm -hmm. Sie sind ja selber in einer fundamentalistisch evangelikalen Kirche in, in den USA aufgewachsen, haben sich davon distanziert. Sie haben sogar gesagt, Sie hätten Jesus äh, gehasst. War das wirklich so? Oh, I never hated Jesus, just to be clear. That was the only thing I kept <laughs> that was still mine. Was haben Sie denn gehasst, die Kirche? Um, the, the legalism. So I was raised in a church where women literally couldn't even pray out loud in front of men. Deswegen Ihre Geschichte umso spezieller eigentlich. In a way, yeah. I mean, I never, I never saw a woman in any kind of yeah. spiritual or religious leadership in a church till I was 27. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, not at all. So, um, and again, I think, um, I mean, that's a huge 
part of my story because I end, I end up being the pastor or a pastoral voice for a lot of people who were raised in very conservative Christianity and yet still have parts of it they want to be able to hold and yet they need to reject a lot of it for reasons of like self-preservation. Yeah. Ich möchte darauf jetzt noch etwas genauer eingehen. Sie haben eine sehr berührende Geschichte, wie Sie überhaupt Pfarrerin geworden sind. Wenn ich mich richtig erinnere, haben Sie eine Begräbnisrede gehalten für einen Freund, der sich suizidiert hat. Mhm. Und da haben Sie dieses quasi Erweckungsgefühl mhm. gehabt. Können Sie das erzählen? Ja, it was um, so. A lot of times, I'm the only religious person in my group of friends. Mm -hmm. And so that was the case back then. I had not gone to seminary yet, but I was um, in recovery and I had been um, in the stand up, I had been doing stand up comedy. And so a friend of mine who was also a stand up comic and who was at my, my 12 step meeting um, sort of succumbed to his uh, battle with uh, mental illness mm -hmm. and died by suicide. And we had his uh, funeral was held in a comedy club downtown in Denver mm -hmm. at the Comedy Works and it was packed. And my friends just looked at me and they were like, well, you could do the funeral, right? You could do the sermon. And I'm like, I guess so, but it was only because I was the only religious person. Also, Sie haben noch gebetet in dieser Zeit, wo Sie so quasi diesen schlimmen Absturz hatten, wo Sie vier yes. Jahre Alkohol hatten. Yes, this is when I'd come back to the church. Yeah. You know, I was, uh, I, this is when I'd come back to Christianity at yeah. this point. For a couple of years, I'd been back into it. And so I looked out over the crowd when I was giving his eulogy, and it was all comics and queers and recovering alcoholics and academics. And I thought, oh, they don't, they don't have a pastor. Mm. And then my next thought was, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm supposed to be their pastor. <laughs> it was just this root. Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> And so um, it was that sense of, of, of calling. So mm. I've never felt like I wanted to be the church's pastor. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be my people's pastor. Yeah. Sie haben eben dann diese Kirche auch gegründet. Ich habe es schon gesagt, House of All Sinners and Saints. Und deswegen nennt man sie eben auch ähm, den, den Pastor der Ausgestoßenen. Wie kam es zu diesem großen Zuwachs, mhm. wie es heute eine große Kirche ist? Ja, yeah, um, it didn't grow as quickly as I wanted the first few years. It was very frustrating. Um, but I ended up being asked to preach at this citywide Easter service, which is at Red Rocks, which is this very famous natural amphitheater outside of Denver. And there's 10,000 people. And I had this little church of like 40 people. Mm -hmm. And um, then the paper in my town, the Denver Post, ran this front page story about me okay. on Easter weekend yeah. and about why is this woman the preacher <laughs> at Red Rocks. And then my congregation sort of doubled overnight because of that. Yeah. So um, a lot of it was that people started from the outside, started taking notice, and so more people heard about it mm -hmm. um, is one reason it grew, I think. Mm -hmm. Ich möchte zum Schluss noch mir die Frage erlauben, Frau Bolzweber, weshalb glauben Sie eigentlich? Hmm. Why I have the faith I do? Hmm. Well, my friend Frank Schaefer, his, um, Francis Schaefer's son, uh, who is a famous evangelical, he had a difficult sort of upbringing with the church, and yet he's still Christian. And in an interview once, he said something that will always make me hate him because I wish I said it, which was somebody said, but you're still part of this. You're still part of Christianity, right? And he goes, I am. And then he goes, All I can say is this, if what I wanted more than anything in the world was to be an atheist, all I'd know to do is to just pray to God to make me one. <laughs> And that's kind of how I feel. Like, um, I, I can't help it. I, as another friend of mine, Rachel Held Evans, says, um, this is the, sto the story of Jesus is the one I'm w I will risk being wrong about. Mm -hmm. Like, 
it's such a compelling story to me mm -hmm. that um, it won't leave me alone. Mm -hmm. It keeps meaning new and different and beautiful things mm -hmm. to me. And it's a lens by which I see myself and other people in the world. And um, I just can't escape it, even if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. Ganz herzlichen Dank für dieses Gespräch, Frau Bolzweber. Yeah, thank you. It's been fun. Thanks. Thank you.